Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to our slash pro revenge. Where in this episode, OP's husband destroys their family after 20 years of marriage, and she goes scorched earth on the man. Guys, I hope you enjoy the super satisfying revenge stories today. And as always, subscribe if you haven't for future stories. So many years ago, I got a job with a marketing company during phone deregulation. It was the Wild West, and a lot of small long-distance companies sprang up, all trying to get a piece of the pie. Eventually, they all got bought up by bigger fish. But at the time, they were all paying marketing firms very well, to score contracts for them to lock people in. I got a job with one of those marketing firms, a new age capitalism company that insisted we all do yoga and breathing exercises, while they rang a little bell and gave us affirmations about how many contracts we were going to sell, and how much money we were going to make. The job was 100% commission, but I was always good at sales, so I looked at the pay scale and noticed that it was exponential, presumably to entice people to work hard with impossible payouts. We were allowed to work as many or as few hours as we wanted, with the payout based on your weekly sales numbers. I decided that I would give it a shot for one week to see how much I could realistically make before deciding if I was willing to put up with the tasteless vegan snacks and mandatory voluntary yoga regime. So for the next week, I pushed myself as hard as I could. For seven straight days, I worked 14 plus hour days every single day using every trick and technique that I had learned doing sales to score as many contracts as I possibly could. I figured this would tell me my maximum potential income, and I could decide on that basis whether to stay. At the end of the week, I had blown everyone else out of the water. In fact, I had not just gotten more contracts than anyone there had ever seen in a week, I had gotten more than any of them had seen in a month. Because of the exponential scale, I realized that I was making absolutely ridiculous amounts of money, like $10,000 plus a week. They had never expected anyone could actually hit those kinds of numbers. So coming the next week, I was expecting a huge payday, but I ended up with 5% of what I expected. They told me that there were problems with my contracts and that I would be allowed to fix them and submit them a few at a time over the next several weeks. Now, the problems were things like an apostrophe that wasn't quite clear, or the dash in someone's phone number was slightly crooked. They were trying to screw me. That night, I get a phone call from the company's office manager, who we'll call Frank, who wanted to meet up for a drink. Curious, I agreed. Over beers, Frank told me that the owners of the company were in a panic, because I would have bankrupted them. He said they spread out all my contracts on the floor in the office, and then they crawled all over them, inspecting each one, trying to figure out if I was committing some kind of fraud. When they comprehended that all my contracts were legit, they decided that they had no choice but to screw me over. That's when Frank told me that he realized at that point, if they would screw me, that they would try to do that to him too. And besides, he was tired of doing yoga. He asked me if I would be willing to go into business with him and go head to head with his bosses. Now I thought it sounded intriguing, but I asked him how he thought we could compete. Frank explained that he had found out that they actually didn't have the contract for our city. They were acting as independent contractors for another company, who had the contract to market the service in an entirely different city. They were poaching here, because the person who did have the contract wasn't actively using it. So together, we put a pitch and approached the guy with the real contract, Joe, and told him about the people poaching his turf. We agreed that we would split with him, and we'd take the upfront money for each contract, and he would get the back-end money down the road. It was a good deal for everyone, so Joe contacted the phone company, and had them threaten the poachers with a big lawsuit if they don't stop. A week later, Frank and I strolled into the offices of our old employer. Most of the furniture and all the yoga mats was gone. There was just a table, a couple of filing cabinets, and a file box with the final pay envelopes for everyone. I made a show of counting my money to make sure it was all there, and the two owners, husband and wife, told Frank and I bitterly that they had to take cash advances on their credit cards for this money, and they asked me if I felt guilty for destroying their lives. I smiled and said, nope, and left. Our marketing company made us a lot of money over the year, until the company got bought out by Sprint and the gravy train ended. Guys, I always find it so funny that when sleazy idiots are caught screwing their employees over, they pull out the victim card. I hope you're happy, you destroyed our lives. What about the people you were taking advantage of? And guys, one thing I've learned with reading all these revenge stories is never, ever, ever mess with anyone's money because it never ends well.
This is a story of my cousin. He used to work as a parking officer a few years ago. The following story happened to him, and his response seemed befitting to the subreddit. So one day, my cousin was off his shift, and he was in his civilian clothing. He was simply shopping for groceries at the supermarket that evening. Once he left the supermarket, he went back to his car and he loaded the trunk with his groceries. He then proceeded to put the key in the ignition and to start the car. But before he was able to exit the parking space, he got blocked by another car, meaning to stop him from leaving his parking spot. Then, out comes a guy who's trying to confront my cousin. The guy knocks on his window and orders him to step out of the vehicle while flashing his badge. It turns out that guy's an undercover cop in civilian clothes and he's driving an unmarked vehicle. My cousin complies and steps out. That's when the jerk says, Seems that you have quite a beast of a ride there, my friend. My cousin responds, It's only a family SUV officer. The jerk says, I'm not quite sure about that. I've heard some unusual sounds from your engine as you pulled over. I suspected you might have installed some illegal performance modifications on your vehicle. My cousin replies, I assure you I haven't. My car is in perfect stock condition. The jerk tells him, well I had to make sure, so I waited for you until you got back. So you can turn the ignition on again, and I do believe there might be a few modifications to your car. Now that I heard it again. My cousin says to him, I'm pretty confident I didn't install any modifications on my car. Feel free to check under the hood. That's when my cousin pops the hood open, and the jerk says, well, what do we have here? It looks like you modified your air intake system. My cousin tells him, that's a stock intake. What makes you even think that this is a modified one? At this point, my cousin's starting to get pissed and questioning his competence at what he's claiming to know. My cousin says, look dude, I'm not even sure you know what you're talking about here. The jerk says, oh I know. I knew it since I heard your unusual engine. I know you're packing. My cousin says, why would anyone even modify a family SUV to make it a street race car? Jerk says, I don't know, you tell me. Anyways, I'm issuing you a ticket for this. My cousin says, you're issuing me a ticket for something you clearly aren't experienced in? Look buddy, you're trying to plant fictional modifications in my car, and I have the hood wide open for you so please drop your act or call in another officer who has more experience than you in these matters. The jerk replies, I don't think that's necessary, I'm pretty confident that your air intake is modified, and I am experienced enough in these matters. Are you telling me what I know or don't know? At this point, the jerk officer now proceeds to head back to his car and grab out the ticket book. And this is where the sweet revenge starts. My cousin's furious, and he decides to retaliate. My cousin heads back to his car as well to grab his own ticket book. While they're facing each other, the jerk was surprised to see a ticket book in my cousin's hands. And he says, what's happening here? My cousin tells him, I'm writing you a ticket too. The jerk says, wait, you're an officer too? And what are you writing me a ticket for? My cousin tells him, yes, I'm a parking officer, and I'm writing a ticket for illegal parking in a driveway and obstructing a parking space and the exits of other vehicles. The jerk tells my cousin, I'm not doing that, I'm right here by my car and I'm available to move it out of the way. I'm only obstructing your exit to carry out my duty, until I issue a violation. That's when my cousin tells him, you're not allowed to do that unless you're in a government vehicle. The jerk says, this is a government vehicle. My cousin tells him, no it's not. It's a civilian car with a public license plate. I'm sorry, but the government vehicle exemption doesn't apply to you in this case. This fine is coming out of your pockets, buddy. That's when the jerk says, I'm just going to appeal to court about this then. The government will just waive your tickets. My cousin says, you try to do that, buddy. If that works, you're welcome to come back to me and spit in my face. Here's what's gonna happen. You take your ticket to court, you plead not guilty on account that I can't find a government vehicle. The rules for undercover cops is if they're in unmarked vehicles, they are fully responsible for any accidents or violations as long as you have your sirens hidden and dispatch haven't sent you. Which is completely true in my country. I go on and tell him, this car is currently treated as a civilian car, since those conditions don't apply. Therefore, you are responsible for this violation. As for my tickets, I'm going to appeal to court as well. The court will assign another experienced officer to inspect my car. And since I'm confident that I didn't modify my car in any way, and you're full of crap, I'm getting this ticket waived. 
This will also possibly get reported and posted in your file at your police station for falsifying violations. My guess is you're trying to fill a ticket quota for promotion or something. I don't know. I don't care. All I know is you messed with the wrong guy. Hearing my cousin say that, the jerk officer's face was reddening with anger. And my cousin shoved his ticket in his hand and tried to grab the one out of his hand. Jerk was reluctant in handing out the ticket, seeing as the outcome was gonna backfire on him. My cousin yanked it out of his hand anyway, and he went inside his vehicle. My cousin then rolls the window down and says, If you'll excuse me now, I need you to move your vehicle. I have a wife and baby son waiting to be fed. The jerk was mumbling as he walks back to his vehicle. All while my cousin was left smiling. Oh, I wish I could see the officer's face when he realized he messed with the wrong person, guys. But honestly, just think, if he did that to the average person who doesn't know any better, it's the cop's word against theirs, and they'd be paying for that ticket. Like, you've gotta wonder, how many people did he do that to before OP's cousin came along? So I'm a 40-year-old female, and I've been married to my husband, who's 44, for 20 years now. We have two kids, who are 16 and 13. My husband is what I would consider a high earner, by middle class standards. Also, strap in folks, because this one's gonna be long. I've never told anyone. So 10 years ago, and by complete coincidence, I found out that my husband had been cheating on me. With men. And also from before we got married. We live in a smallish town in the south of the USA, and him coming out as gay will have consequences. I believe that that's the only reason that he hasn't come out to anyone. First, here's how I found out he was cheating on me. My husband got sloppy. He left a credit card bill for a secret card in the pocket of a coat. While going through it, I found all the telltale signs of infidelity. There were payments to a hotel in a nearby county, restaurant bills, gifts, flowers, adult toy shops, etc. I started camping outside the hotel on days he told me he would be late, and I saw him bringing several different men there. I have a very good poker face, so I was able to give myself the time to cool off and come up with what I should do. The first thing I did was get an STD panel since I didn't know how safe he was with his partners. It came out negative, and then I convinced him that we should use condoms since I was having side effects from the pill, and he was okay with it. I had a long think, and I came to the decision that I wasn't going to confront him, nor was I going to leave him. The man was able to provide me with a really good lifestyle, one that I would never be able to afford with my high school diploma. We had a cleaning lady, a nanny to help with the kids, regular spa days, and a country club membership. He would also buy me a new car every other year, and we would go on luxury family vacations every year. He was a good dad, and a good partner, aside from the cheating. But with that, I wasn't gonna let him have a single guilt-free week in his life. That would be my revenge. So I started small planning great date nights for us, telling him that I felt our relationship has cooled and that I wanted the spark back. Then, I would sometimes slip into conversation something I heard about a cheating husband, or a gay man that's been using his poor wife as a beard, complimenting the only gay couple we know for having the courage to be real men, who were out and proud of themselves. On the other hand, I would praise him as the perfect husband to anyone and everyone, especially if he was in earshot. The amount of guilt gifts I got was astounding, the man was even sending me flowers weekly. This continued the same way for years, I could literally see how much it was weighing on him. And me, well, my parents were part of a commune with the concept of free love, I was the same. I just considered myself in an open marriage. It seems that cheating is easier to ignore if you're not that big on monogamy in the first place. And also, my husband was keeping me satisfied, so I felt no need to find a partner of my own. And then, four years ago, I guess he met the love of his life. He started seeing just one guy, and I was seriously thinking of ending the whole thing. Especially since I started a business by then, and I was able to bring in enough money to support myself and my kids while maintaining my lifestyle. But here's where things took a turn. He went and he introduced his side piece to us. He effing brought the man into our house and introduced him to our kids, and that was enough for me to keep tormenting him. Apparently, the man he introduced to the family was a new friend he made while golfing. He then starts hinting at moving to another state, one where it would be easier for him to come out. I refused. I told him that my business was here, and I wasn't going to start over in another state. Also, the kids had their friends and extended family here, so it would be unfair to uproot them. Then, he started trying to start arguments. 
I guess he wanted us to fight, and then for me to ask for a divorce. I just stopped all those arguments in their tracks. I would just agree with whatever he said. He was always right, and I was wrong. And to make it up to him, how about some nice dinner and some great sex, and he hated that. I knew from spying on his phone that sleeping with me felt like cheating on his boyfriend, which is funny. I also knew that his boyfriend was pressuring him to leave me almost every day. He was at a point where he was stuck between a rock and a hard place, and he started drinking. And when it got too heavy, that's when I decided that enough was enough. I wanted to ruin his life, not his health. Also, I grew up with an alcoholic father, and I didn't want that for my kids. So with that, I gathered all the evidence of his infidelity over the last nine years. Photos with different men, conversations, his grinder profile, everything. Then I hired a divorce attorney. On top of that, I mailed the evidence to his employer, as he has a morality clause in his contract, and adultery breaks it. I also sent it to all of his relatives, including his parents, as well as our church. And it was like a bomb exploded. He was fired, and the congregation turned on him. And I do want to note that they turned on him for cheating, not for being gay. Let's keep that straight. I would never allow my kids to be part of a church that discriminated against their father, even if he wasn't out. Because of this, his life was ruined, and his own parents wouldn't take him in after I kicked him out, and he was shamed publicly. Gotta love that small town gossip mill. And the cherry on top was his boyfriend was run out of the town, and he couldn't even follow him because he wanted to fight for custody of our kids. Now it's almost a year later, and I'm a free woman. I got to keep the house, my car, and my business. He got 75% of the retirement and investments accounts, but he won't be paying alimony. I got full custody while he got visitations, and I also got child support. He had to move six hours away to find a new job, and he couldn't put the last job he worked his whole life at as a reference. His relationship with his family is rocky, and his reputation in town is ruined, so he can't move back anytime soon. The love of his life also left him for good, and my kids only tolerate him because I did my best to shield them, and to tell them that he's still a good father to them. I also made sure to treat him politely around my kids and never talked bad about him. We had a lengthy talk about how their father being gay is okay. It's who he is, and that's not his fault. That the only wrong thing he did was hiding it from me. So I guess the results of his cheating was years of guilt followed by a ruined life. And let's make something clear. I'm not the good person in this story. We were both bad. I'm not here trying to get pats on the back or be told that I did well. I know what I did was messed up, and I'm here because I wanted to tell someone, and I can't do that in real life. Oh my goodness, guys. And what makes this revenge even sweeter is OP admitted she wasn't even a good person. She just did what she needed to do to get the job done. And honestly, OP's husband cheated on her for decades, and he deserved what he got. Especially after introducing the lover to the family as a golfing buddy, thinking the wife had no clue. I can understand why OP went scorched earth. This is the perfect example of effing around and finding out, sir. And in this case, literally. This happened about a year ago. I came home from spending a weekend at my girlfriend's to find my condo had been broken into. The place was trashed, and about $18,000 worth of camera equipment and electronics were stolen. I made a report with the police, and they did absolutely nothing. That's when I tried to get in touch with the detective, to no avail. Another unit in my condo complex had also been burgled, and they took their computer, but more importantly their car keys and car. Now, my keys were also stolen. But I think since my car's a manual, they elected to take a much more boring automatic car that my neighbor had. So after a day of trying to get the police to take matters seriously, at around 10pm that same night, I get a ping. My laptop had been opened and connected to the internet. I look for the location, and it turns out it's at a hotel about a half a mile away from my house. So at this point, I realize that I'm not dealing with criminal masterminds. I ride down to the hotel to see if the desk person will tell me which room they're in, since I do have a pretty good idea for where the room is, all except for which floor they're on. They of course don't tell me, but as I'm leaving, I see my neighbor's car just sitting on the street. So we call AAA and the police, steal the car back, and tow it to a different location, somewhere else in the neighborhood. We did that since the thieves still have the keys and they could easily come and steal it back. 
My neighbor has resigned to rekeying his car and dealing with that expensive headache, but it's still a win to have the car retrieved. So while we were there, I thought it would be a good idea to bring the police with me to the hotel desk. But without a warrant or backup, they're unwilling to even knock on the door. The next morning, I get up nice and early, call the detective assigned to my case, and he has the answers. The guy had just gotten in, and the file's on his desk, and I tell him what I know and ask if it's a good or bad idea to go to the hotel and wait for them to leave so I can confront them and maybe get some of my stuff back. The detective says that's a terrible idea, so that's exactly what I do. This forces his hand somewhat, and he ends up meeting me at the hotel with his partner. Just as I was introducing myself, three young males walk past the lobby, one of which is wearing my backpack. That's when I scream, hey, there goes my backpack. The detectives detain the young men, and find my laptop, my iPad, another laptop, and a set of keys. Now, I don't know what probable cause really is, but three guys walking out of a hotel room with $3,000 worth of my stolen goods seems like it should be. But no, they knock on the door, but don't enter. That does suck, but I have insurance, and that ends up covering it. Now, for the revenge part. Only one guy was carrying anything stolen, so he faces a pretty massive stolen property charge and he pleads out to a year in jail. Now that's not bad, right? Well, in my victim impact statement, I talk about how I feel unsafe now and how the insurance company had to pay me out and I request restitution for the full amount, plus the new security system we've installed on our property. The suspect is staring daggers at me. Apparently in the interrogation, he was incredibly angry, and he was at a complete loss for how he got caught. I'm happy enough to fill in the courtroom with those details, and I give an interview to a local paper. So whenever anyone googles his fairly distinctive name, all of this comes up. I also have a protection order against him. He's scheduled to be released soon, but with my new security system, I don't think I'll be having any problems in the future. And maybe he learned a valuable lesson. Probably not though, but the felony on his record should be a nice reminder. Don't break the law, a-hole. Hey, sometimes you just gotta take matters into your own hands, guys. And honestly, it's a shame the cops wouldn't do anything until OP did something. And it's also a good thing OP's insurance paid him out for his stolen stuff, because we all know he's not getting a penny from the thief. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash pro revenge. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the stories today. If you did, hit the thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, consider subscribing so you don't miss these crazy stories. And if you missed the last episode on the channel, it's an r slash I don't work here, lady where a Karen tries to get OP's cousin arrested for not being Mexican enough. It's such a crazy story, so go check it out if you haven't, and myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.